Hello, everybody. I am Josh Welsh, president of Film Independent, and thank you for joining us today for this amazing conversation, part of Film Independent Presents, the virtual edition. Um, before we get started, just a couple quick thanks. I want to thank our lead sponsor, the organization that makes Film Independent Presents possible, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. Thank you all so much. We love you. Um, I also want to thank our screening partner, Vision Media, and our media partner, the Los Angeles Times. Um, for anyone watching live, please take advantage of the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Towards the, at the end of this conversation, um, we'll, we'll get to your questions, but send them our way throughout. Um, I just wanna say personally, to me, this is such an exciting conversation that you all are about to witness. Melissa Hazlip is an amazing filmmaker who we at Film Independent have been so honored and lucky to know these past many years. She went through our project involved mentorship program she was the recipient of the Roger and Chaz Ebert Fellowship at the Film Independent Spirit Awards, and she's made an incredible film with Mr. Soul. So very excited to, to have this conversation with Melissa today. And then, okay, COVID is horrible. We all hate COVID. It's a terrible thing. But there's one good thing about it, which is, and there's a good thing about Zoom, where we get to bring together amazing people for conversations online where, let's face it, in the real world, this would be really hard to pull off. There's some amazing special guests today, but none more amazing than Lena Waithe, who will be moderating today. Lena is a longtime friend of Film Independent, Spirit Award nominee for Dear White People, somebody whose work we've screened at Film Independent Presents, and she's always there supporting up and coming filmmakers and, and, the, and the community. So with that, I will stop blabbering. And I just want to say thank you both for being here. Thank you to everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lena Waithe. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to say hi. This, this also feels like an episode of, of uh, Soul, by the way, because uh, Mr. Underwood is driving. Uh, my car, Robert over here got somewhere to be. We have the legendary, the amazing, um, Ms. Giovanni, all blessings and peace be on to you. I'm so honored to be, uh, for us, all of us to be sharing this space with you. And we're so grateful that you're here with us. You're what I like to call one of our living ancestors. And so thank you so much. For being Thank here. you. Glad to be here. Amazing. So, um, look, we'll get, since, since Mr. Underwood is driving and he's got to get on the flight, I want to throw him the first question. So, how? Which is, I know the, the question everybody asks, like, well, how did you get involved? Da, 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 da. My question for you is, did you like? How familiar were you with this show, and why was it so important for you to narrate? And you do such a beautiful job narrating the film. He's on mute right now, which is like classic. We're, we're, there you go. Is, All right, can you hear me? I got, I got you. I see you with the peanut butter uh, interior. Let's get it. You 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 want to stand? You want to stand? Come on now. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I pulled over. I should probably pull over and be legal up in here. Uh, exactly. okay. First of all, I will answer your question, Lena. But let me just say thank you to Josh and Film Independent for this platform. Yes. Thank, thank you, Melissa Hazlip, for creating uh, Mr. Soul this project because I'm yes. honored, just completely honored. Um, and amazed to be a part of this project. Um, and Lena Waithe, let me thank you, because you know I'm a fan of yours. And just to watch your star shine and your trajectory in the last 10, 15 years has been phenomenal to, to see. But your support of this film in this moment right now is invaluable. So I thank you for that. Um, so how I got involved, no, 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 I, I, you did not ask that question. You asked about, uh, did I know about it? And the thing was, I did not know about it. You know, mm. Melissa was kind enough to, at the very end, when she had shot everything and she had her final cut, she reached out to me then um, and invited me to narrate the, the project and be the voice of, of, of her uncle, Ellis Hazlip. But when I saw the trailer, I was like, my God, why do I, why do I not know about this show? Because yeah. anybody who was anybody and everybody who was everybody in the black community and culture came through the, those stages in those five, six years. Um, so I could, I, I don't think I could pick up the phone fast enough to say, Melissa, how can I be involved? I want to be down. <laughs> I think not unlike you, when you, when you got hit through, you said, I, I want to be involved in this somehow. Absolutely. No, that's good to know. And I think, uh, for me, I became aware of, of, of soul through a conversation between amazing Miss Giovanni and, and James Baldwin. And I actually saw that conversation while I was wrapping up filming Queen and Slim. So it was a very huge moment for me. And, and, the, and that conversation became such a pivotal part of, I think, my education and my understanding um, and just and who I wanted to be as a Black artist and how I wanted to be remembered. And, um, and I'll ask this to Mr. Giovanni, like, how should we be surprised 
uh, that a queer black man help orchestrate that conversation between you two that would really go on to inspire so many people. Should we be surprised by that? <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. Ellis was uh, really wonderful in, in terms of uh, producing. That, that's one of the things that he did. And when, when the idea of Soul started, I knew Ellis, I, I met Ellis, and of course, I think everybody did. But one of the things that he wanted to do, because he was he was afraid that he would not be accepted, one of the things he did was um, uh, Alvin Poussaint. He asked Alvin if he would be the host. And we were friends, Ellis and I were friends. And he came up and we talked about it. And he said, you know, I'm going to ask Alvin. I said, Ellis, it's your show. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of It's Your Show. I said, it's your show. Why don't you do it? He said, no, people won't like me. And I'll be there. I said, Alice, you know, take my word for it. He said, no. And so Alvin, uh, and I'm not against Alvin, but Alvin hosted, I think, three shows. Mm -hmm. And of course, he was terrible. And <laughs> he was, I mean, it wasn't personal, but Alvin is, a, uh, he's not a theater person. And he's a critic and uh, it just, it wasn't his thing. And so, and I say came up because I lived on Amsterdam Avenue and Ellis was down in the village, but he came up and he said, it's not working. And I said, oh no, I, and I knew it wouldn't. He said, well, why don't you do it? And I said, Ellis, this is not what I do. I, I, I'm, I'm not good at, I, I can't ask anybody a question because I'm, I'm mostly not that interested. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in listening and watching, but I'm not, I'm not a journalist. I said, why don't, it's your show, why don't you, do it. He said that uh, they're, they're not going to like me. I said, Ellis, you know, you're a big boy. You've heard no before. Do mm -hmm. the show. It's your show. Do the show. And so he decided, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. We have to always remember, uh, Melissa, and I'm sure you do, Novella Nelson. And and Novella made, made a big uh, 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 impact on that. So he said he would do it. Well, of course, he looked gorgeous because he was a gorgeous, he, he dressed and uh, really before a lot of people doing it, he had, I remember that, that suit and then he would have a pocket on a handkerchief and his tie. He always looked, he, he looked great. And so everybody was like, oh, you know, let's check it out. And in checking out Soul, he got to be more and more comfortable. And the only thing that made him uncomfortable is that, uh, remember, he wanted um, Louis Farrakhan. And he said, Farrakhan won't, won't come because, you know, Farrakhan is a Muslim and he won't. I said, Ellis, anybody will do television ask him, <laughs> have your people called to ask. And of course, you know, Farrakhan was uh, extremely happy. I knew uh, personally um, uh, Muhammad Ali and Muhammad Ali and I shared a uh, publicist, uh, Victoria Lucas. So he, I said, why don't you get, you know, Ali? And he said, you think so? I said, oh yeah, Vicky, I'll talk to Vicky. And, and so that's how he got Ali, but everybody wanted to be on his show. And again, you have to give novella a lot of credit because she had said to him, no matter what you're doing, make sure that this show looks good. We're not just going to let a bunch of, for lack of a better word, a bunch of Negroes walk on stage and their hair is all messed up and their, their clothes are not, you know, polished. So it was, it was to Novella's credit that we had a makeup person, that we had a hair person, and we had somebody there for the clothes. Wow, and, uh, I, I don't think everybody was just looking fly naturally on their own, <laughs> but like, but I, but that's that's good to know. And, and if you wouldn't mind, uh, Melissa, I wanted to ask you because obviously you felt the need, and there's obviously a, a, a familial reason as to why you wanted to do the documentary. But even if you were not, if you didn't share the, the, the same last name as the person that the documentary is centered around, would you have just been as interested in this story and wanting to tell it? But obviously, there was a, a, a bigger reason at, at play. But why do you think everybody should know? I think people who have seen the movie will know why they need to know Ellis's name. But why did you think that people needed to know the legacy? And I'm so grateful to you for do, making this movie because I was very familiar with the work, but I didn't know the person behind it. To me, he's a he's like almost like the Bayard Rustin of, of, of like public live television. It's like he's the architect that nobody sees. So can you tell me why it was so important for people to know who he was? Yes, and thank you so much, especially for being here today. I just wanted, I'm just so excited. <laughs> I'm obsessed with it. I'm obsessed with the doc. I'm, I'm, like, like, I'm like, what's happening? Yeah. Um, it's, it's really important when we think about our legacy and, and how we approach that and the stories that we're telling uh, and, and the importance of telling our own stories. And there's so many pockets of history where we have been so instrumental in 
forming culture and changing history in that way. And Ellis Hayslip was like an unsung hero to me. And of course, I'm related, so there is that. But I saw him as fundamentally changing the perception of African Americans and African American culture by right. presenting it in a way that was completely unique because it was true, it was real, it was based on love. You yeah. know, it was about black love, black strength, black sister and brotherhood, black agreement, black disagreement, all yeah. the complexities of our culture. And mm -hmm. so I was just blown away when I finally got to see the full breadth of all the all the shows because I was kind of too young when it first came on. And mm -hmm. um, when I realized like this is a time capsule, but it's also a love letter to black culture. And Absolutely. we need that now more than ever, you know, talk about restoring the soul of a nation like his voice as a revolutionary, as mm -hmm. a, an unsung hero, as a queer icon, all of those things put together, make him somebody that that really should be known because it really has impacted the way we see ourselves and the trajectory of, of just black presence and, and inclusion on television, even Absolutely. if it was subtle or not, you know? For sure. yeah. yeah, and Blair and Robert, I know you guys have to jump, but I want to throw you guys this question, which I'm sure everybody in the, the question, the Q and A box, which I have in front of me are asking is could, and I, of course I thought this too, while I was watching a documentary is like, could we do this today? And I was thinking I had my wheels turning, like, could this exist now? Could, how would this look? How would it feel? But I just want to ask you two, and feel free to answer this question. I'll let you guys uh, get to where you're going. But could this exist today? Obviously, we would need it. But also, my question is, is there, I'm going to say, is there an audience for it? Yes, I'm sure a lot of folks are going to go, yeah, there's an audience for it. But I do think that was a very different time, you know, that you have two phenomenal authors sitting down and having a conversation about the relationship between black men and black women within our community. I do think it's a very interesting thing. And Melissa and Ms. Giovanni, I would like to get your thoughts on this because the conversation between him and Minister Farrakhan made me somewhat uncomfortable as a queer black person, you know, and I want to get into that. But um, but Robert and Blair, can, can we can you guys speak to is there space for something like soul today before y'all get out of here? Rob, you want to jump I on that first? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think there definitely is space um, for it um, because of Soul, because of because of shows like Soul, you know, there's so many offsprings of, of artists, first of all, so many offsprings of artists and, you know, um, uh, so many people with voices, you know, mm -hmm. and especially now, so many people with voices that are speaking out and talking about issues and creating creating art that that represents different things and issues and i think it's i think today is is a is a great time to do something like so um I, we talked about that before I mean, in my mind i was always thinking of who would be the host of soul because number one i will be the music director don't want it out there melissa just so you'll know in your mind okay don't want it out there i want to be the md you know what i mean but i think it'll be amazing i think it'd be amazing i think i think it's needed you know, I, I, I honestly think that kind of show is, is, is needed for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I hear yeah, you. Yeah, brother. I, I think it's absolutely necessary and I think it's doable right now. You know, I think you look at you look at soul and you had the musical performances and you had the poetry uh, uh, um, readings, um, but you had the conversations, you had the interviews. And I think that's what we don't see today. We have exactly. so many fractured chapters and channels and, and whatnot. But we get a chance finally, like never before, to show all elements, the breadth, the width and depth of our people. But to actually just sit down, I mean, what's so iconic, and you can just pull this, it's in our film, of course, but it's, it's, it's been plastered all over YouTube. The conversation between Miss Giovanni and James Baldwin absolutely. is just, it's iconic and classic. So, um, so the answer to the question is absolutely yes. We got to find a way to do it. So Lena, maybe all of us and Melissa, Melissa, we talked about that. We can find a way to make that happen. But before I go, can I say this real quick? Say Ms. Giovanni, yeah. Ms. Giovanni, we've done a couple of these and I have never met Ms. Giovanni. Oh. I am a huge fan and I have tremendous profound respect for Ms. Giovanni. And I just wanted to give a deep bow and show respect and say hello and say, I love you and thank you for, for, for making the path and, and everything you've yep. done to uh, open doors for all of us in our generation and beyond. 
Well, thank you, Blair. I'm, I'm such a, a fan of yours before you have the, <laughs> the beer. <laughs> I remember <laughs> <laughs> like move, get back to them LA law days. LA law days. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so I, thank you very much. Um, and you know, I, I want to say this before you leave. We have to remember the Beatles wouldn't have been anything without Ed Sullivan. Um, mm. think about mm. it. And mm -hmm. I think that that's kind of the way we have to begin thinking. That's right. How do, how do we want to put the whole thing together? And mm, I right. remember my grandparents woke me up one night to say. Wake Nikki up, Lena Horne is on television because that's how few black people used to be on TV. Right. And it, it would be wonderful to be able to put a, together a show that has blacks and whites and whomever sitting down and talking, doing certain uh, point, different points of view. I think it'd be a much needed show. And Absolutely. I think it, would, it should be hosted by someone black. I, I wouldn't have a clue uh, who, but I think, yeah, we, we need, yeah, soul or something of that nature, America or the right way or something. Yeah, we, we, we need it, yeah. Yeah, we, maybe we could have that conversation between ta Coates and Cornell West, by the way. Um, Come on now. Come on now. See? But I, but, but I think that's the thing. It's like we, we need those opportunities for our people to sit down. Or like, I still want to see a conversation between Gail and Snoop. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think the conversations between us, particularly the, the ones, the generational ones, need to happen and it's really important that they happen in front of us like again uh like we, we can reference the the, the Ms. giovanni and baldwin conversations again and again because there's so much we're literally watching uh mr baldwin learn something or see things differently because of Ms. giovanni and i think that is so interesting we're so not used to seeing that that a, a, a younger generation educating an older generation, but also watching him beautifully pull rank in certain instances where he's sort of like, hold on, hold on. He's like, I've been here longer. I, this is not That's new right. to me. You know, and so in all, we know that we know that feeling. We know when that that uncle who who you know who you who is a little bit wiser and knows more sometimes, but he says in such a beautiful and respectful way, and I think we have gotten so far away from that. So that's my hope to, to have that back. Um, so yeah, but but Blair Robert, we want to let y'all go, and then we we'll keep this going. Thank you so much, Blair. Thank yes, you so sir. much. Thank you. We appreciate you. Thank, thank you. Guys. Happy holidays, everybody. All right. Ladies, 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 have a safe trip, both of you. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. And thank before you, so you go. Much. Before you go, real quick, I just want to say thank you to both of you guys. You know, of you are the anchors of of the film with the voice and the music. And what I really want to do is give you your flowers now. So yes. what I have for everybody is oh, come on, flowers. I give you flowers. Oh, you flowers. <laughs> <laughs> for you. And gentlemen, I would, you know, do flowers for you too. But I think it's important that we give flowers now. Of you course. Know? Yes, indeed. In retrospect. <laughs> Yes. We may not see each other again, or we may not come together in that way. And I'm all about giving props while we're here. And all Indeed. of you are just, you know, blazing trails and and pushing the culture forward. And so I say you. shout out to all y'all. Wow. Yeah. Melissa, thank and you. Thank you, Ms. Giovanni. I'll them for you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Right. Giovanni, for being who you are. Thank you, Lena. I love thank your work. You. I just I just finished the shy. I'm a little late, but oh. I just finished the shy. I saw Queen of Slim. Matter of oh. fact, Lena, we got we got our Emmys together, our first Emmys together, the same oh. night. Really? Oh, come on now. Yeah, because I I, 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 I I did the music for the thirteenth film, the the oh. last the last song. So me and Common got an Emmy that night, and I saw you get up there and get your Emmy. And I I was afraid to talk to you. I saw you in the court. And I was like, dang, I'm gonna say something, but I didn't. I never say anything, but. I'm a big fan, uh, for sure, uh, 100%. You, I appreciate you. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, Blair. Sure. Appreciate, you. appreciate you. Absolutely. Um, Much proud yeah, Drive safe. Drive safe. Get out of here. Um, so now, and so it's funny because we have a, a question in here. Somebody says, what's one of your favorite moments uh, or segments in the film? And I know for me, yes, besides the amazing conversation between Ms. Giovanni and James Baldwin, I also really was very fascinated by the conversation between Ellis and Minister Farrakhan. Um, and, and, and obviously, uh, as a queer Black person, it, it was a, a very unique conversation. It was one that I was not aware of. Um, so, and, and it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one. You know, it's a, you watch it, a, somebody, two people watch a, walk a tightrope. 
um, because of, but also there's a level of respect uh, that, that was sort of there between the, the two men. And I love it if you two could, because that's one of my favorite segments in the movie. I love that you two could speak to that, that segment and when, what you guys were thinking about. And then also if you wouldn't mind speaking to some of your, your favorite moments from the show. Sure. Did, go first. Did you want to go you. first, Nikki? Yes. Well, obviously, my, my favorite is going to be when we had the women doing the poetry reading. Putting that yes. together was so, that was so wonderful because you hadn't seen, what was that, five women, six women standing on stage, yes. Black women reading yes. poetry that said what they wanted to say. That really was uh, probably one of my, if not the, uh, I, I like what I did with Jimmy too. I mean, don't misunderstand, but that was <laughs> putting, putting that together. <laughs> it was just wonderful to see black women uh, doing that. And there was, um, uh, what was that young young group? Uh, Ice, no, not. The Last Poets? No, it, it, there, were those, it, there were three boys, uh, you know. Oh, Black like, Ivory. Black Ivory. Oh. I, loved, I loved watching them. But Ellis brought a lot of people on stage who we would not have seen. And that's why I mentioned, um, I mentioned Ed Sullivan because she used to bring strange, not strange, but different groups, <laughs> kind of strange. He would bring different groups together. And Ed Sullivan, you know, everybody, you know where everybody in America was on Sunday night mm. because they were sitting in front of the television looking at Ed Sullivan. Mm. Me in the black community, you knew where we were because we were like also watching Soul. And I think that uh, we were talking earlier, but I think we need that kind of uh, variety show because right yeah. now we don't, we only have the side you agree with or the side you don't agree with. So I, I think it would be, and I like the music. I like having, I like the conversation. I like yeah. the people making their statements, but I love the music that, that the youngsters would come in. Yeah, Black Eyed, that's, what, that's lovely. <laughs> you know, I, I watch the kids come in and you watched, uh, uh, that's how I met Nina Simone. You watch yeah. Nina come in and she's going to sing sometime, but you also, she played a fabulous, fabulous piano. And mm -hmm. she could, you know, you oh wow, people didn't know that she could that she could do that. I yeah. was always sorry, Melissa, that we weren't able to get Leontine Price or Jesse Norman on, oh. which we couldn't do for a lot of reasons. It was it was just it was money for one thing. But God, wouldn't it just been wonderful to have Miss Price sing a spiritual, or to have Miss Norman or Miss 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 Price sing from Porgy and Bess? Let's just open the show with Summertime. Yes. Melissa, Which, what about what? Yes, absolutely. Melissa, what about you? What were some of your favorite moments, and what are your thoughts on the Farrakhan conversation? Oh yes, I want to talk about the Farrakhan because I had a lot of reservations about that, and I, because I know how he, and there are very mixed feelings about him. There, uh, mm -hmm. he's quite has been and continues to be reviled in the United States, but then he also leads the Nation of Islam. And Absolutely. so there's, there's, it's almost like a duality that he uh -huh. inhabits very much the way Ellis did. And what we chose to show it, you know, because I realized how can I censor him 50 years later? If they right. didn't censor Ellis in, you know, 1972, then is it my place to censor and not show that? So what I decided to do was, was pick the part of the episode where it shows Ellis's bravery. Yeah. Because it, that was what was important to me, was how is Ellis responding and how is Ellis challenging uh, Farrakhan in that he was bringing to the fore the fact that the Nation of Islam was notoriously homophobic. And uh -huh. so I just thought that was so powerful that Ellis Hazlip as a queer Black man could stand in his truth and mm -hmm. challenge him about something that was really his entire being. And it represented so much more at that moment, because here are two men. And what, what's fascinating when you watch that is it's like game recognizes game because mm -hmm. Ellis on the one hand is giving him a platform for what he does, but he's also challenging him and taking him to task for what's wrong with what's going down in the nation. But yeah. at the same time, they have to respect each other because that there's that sense of community that we have uh -huh. in the Black Absolutely. family. Like we will not tear each other down. We may be diametrically opposed, but normally uh -huh. we won't. And so that was interesting to me too, that layer of, of, of love, respect and disagreement. And so I, I wanted Ellis to emerge as a hero in that moment and to stand in that truth. And so that's why I decided to show that part. I'm curious how you felt about it. 
No, I mean, I thought, yeah, I, I thought it was, it was beautifully done. And I think that it reminded me of times, you know, when you're the queer black kid at Thanksgiving, you know, uh, mm -hmm. a little bit figuratively, you know, that you have an uncle, you have an aunt, you have a cousin who is family, but doesn't necessarily agree with what they may deem as a, a life choice. Mm -hmm. And, but there still has to be respect sometimes given to those that may not always see you completely. Yeah. And that can be very difficult. And I think he, he basically represented all of us in that moment, you know, and I thought it was really beautifully done. So thank you for showing me that because I didn't know that existed. I didn't know that the conversation ever happened. And, and nobody was, was really talking about that on, especially right. in public television and certainly not a black man, you know, standing up for, uh, you know, same gender loving folks that that wasn't even possible at that time right in the right. united states anywhere really so it really showed um so much strength and pride Powerful. and he didn't yeah. flinch you know he just sat there and he asked the yeah. question and yeah. he said you know on the one hand i'm going to support you and i'm going to fill the whole audience with nation of islam so you'll be preaching yeah. to the choir yeah. <laughs> on the other hand i've got a really important thing to show you and let's see what you do let's see no. how we how we do it and at beautiful. the end, they both emerge intact, but there mm -hmm. has been a breach in a way, like a, a demanding of respect. And Absolutely. at least uh, that's why I love how I, having Thomas Allen Harris talk about it and to see how he felt at it, uh, about it as a queer black man and what, what that meant to him in that moment. And um, that was really important to show because it showed Ellis standing in his truth, which he always did. Absolutely. And a, a question that keeps popping up in, in the Q&A as well is, where can people see episodes of the show? Yes, yes. Okay, luckily there are 24... Body conversation. That is on YouTube. Yes. But for other but episodes... You yes. can actually see 24 full episodes, y'all, if you go to, if you have Amazon Prime, they just went up on Amazon Prime, so you can watch all 24, um, some of the best episodes. Then if you don't have Prime, uh, if you are a member of PBS Passport, you can watch there, but it's not some memberships like a paywall. But you can also watch at Shout Factory TV, which is free, and Tubi TV and Pluto TV. And then there are a few stragglers, you know, people have uploaded their own bootleg copies on, on YouTube too, of course, because that's what we do. Um, but you can see those intact. And uh, um, I'm hoping that this, conversation that happens out of the film constantly in the community will help build an awareness around this extraordinary archive because it really is a treasure trove you know mm -hmm. it's just amazing and i hope that maybe you know it will inspire uh the whole series to be re-released -re or made again maybe that's yeah, the answer too. Absolutely. uh miss giovanni how important was that time for you to be a part of this this, you know, I don't even want to call it a resurgence because we've always been here, yeah. but what was it like for you to be at the forefront and to be at the center, really, of this show that would really kind of exist as a time capsule for all of us? Well, first of all, you have to admit, we, we didn't know it was the time capsule. We right. were just, uh, NBC, no, not NBC, NPR had mm -hmm. offered um, Ellis the opportunity. I don't know how that happened. Something Melissa might have. I just knew it did. And people were just dealing with young poets like me. And so when Ellis asked me, what did I think? And that's what that really amounted to. What did I think? I knew a couple of things. And I share that with anybody out there. I knew I didn't want to work for NPR. Because if I started to work for NPR, I would lose my ability yeah. to be. PBS, right? So I knew that. Yeah. And uh, I said, OK. but. Yes, of course, I've been like Ellis. I've always remembered, uh, and, and Melissa, you probably heard it, but uh, Ellis was always saying, you know, Duke Ellington owes me, and I would fall for this every time, so would everybody else. And you'd say, well, why does Duke Ellington owe you, Ellis? And he said, because, you know, he was down, you know, all of the all from D.C. And he said he was, he was in New York, and he was trying to get to Harlem, and he asked my aunt, how did he get to Harlem? And she said, mm, you take the A train. <laughs> every time and, and, and we fell for it every time and uh he was he was a lot of fun to be around and of course he was a producer so he did produce very well and i can think of a couple of people as i think about it who also right now in new york um, i'm not in new york anymore but i thought it was good to be 
invited to be a part of it as a part of my generation. And when asked, my answer is always going to be yes. But at the end of that year, that first year, Ellis knew he owed me because he hadn't been paying me. And he said, what, what, what would you, what can I do? I owe you, what can I do? And I said, oh, Ellis, I would really love to talk to James Baldwin. And he said, well, I know Jimmy. And I was just like, oh, you know, James Baldwin, you know, I was like, and he said, yeah, he said, I'll call him. And Baldwin said, oh, I'd love to talk to Nikki Giovanni, but um, he was in uh, 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 his, his place in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, yeah. Was he Paris or London? Paul Devon, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, South of France, and yeah. He said, but I, don't have, you know, I don't have time to come to the United States. Would she mind coming to London? And so Ella said that. I said, you got to be kidding. I'd walk to London to talk to James Baldwin. And oh. so I went to London. Of course, it was wonderful. And the show was shot in London. And you mm -hmm. can see the difference. When you look at that, you can see the difference. Because yeah. Jimmy and I talk with our hands. And so the British shoot that way. And so you'll see that we're, we're all talking with our hands. We're all doing things like that. And so the, uh, it was shot very uh, interestingly. And Jimmy is a night owl, as some of you, if you know him at all, knew him. Uh, he was a night owl. So we would start shooting at a, like about eight o'clock and we'd shoot for a couple of hours. And then he'd go off with his friends and have dinner or whatever. I would go, to, I had my son with me, I'd go to bed. <laughs> you know, and so we were shooting at night. It was really, and again, it was wonderful because it was in everybody's time in, mm -hmm. in terms of how, how it worked. But my son, of course, like everybody, fell in love with Mr. Baldwin. And mm -hmm. so Thomas, his name is Thomas. He, when Thomas, when we went to breakfast, Jimmy was coming in from being out with his friends. He knew everybody. And so Thomas would say, Jimmy Baldwin, Jimmy Baldwin, take me for a walk. And, you know, <laughs> I'm sure Bob was like, oh my God. And he didn't want to, and Thomas would pull on him until he did it. And uh, we would take, he would take my son for a walk, which was really nice. And by then he was ready to go to bed. And I would, uh, of course, I took Thomas uh, around and showed him London. So it was, um, and I think the show showed a lot of a relationship that, that sort of grew. And yeah. uh, not sort of, but it did grow. And I'm very uh, lucky I have a, photograph that Jill Crimmins took of uh, Baldwin and me, and I have on a scarf I no longer have. And I, it sits right there. I look at it every day when I get it in my car because it's in my garage. I look at it every day. I look at it every day because it's right there. When I get in my car, that's what I see is I see, I see Baldwin. Wow. And I think that that kind of opportunity, I recently, and I don't want to hog, but I recently did a conversation uh, in oh, Edmonds, oh. Uh, yeah. with Rhapsody. And yes, it was a short, but uh, somebody said, well, what are you doing? I said, yes. And Rhapsody is a young woman. And so yeah. I thought as an older, yeah, she's about the same age. I was 20 years younger than Jimmy. And mm. she's about 20 years younger, a little bit more than 20 years younger than I am. So I thought, yeah, we, we owe each other that. And that's yeah. what a show like that does show, how we, how we talk to each other, how, how the generations yeah, absolutely. And, and it's so important. And I think, Melissa, I think it's important for people to know that Ellis did coordinate that conversation and so many conversations and so many opportunities for, for us to be able to look at uh, ourselves. That's the great thing is that he, 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 he took the best of us and put us on television. And so we at home can say, oh, that is who we are. That we're poetic, we're musical, we're you know, we're, we're radical, uh, you know, we're, we're vulnerable. And, and I think that's what I really saw in it. And also someone did have, um, you know, I think, I think we have, we have a hard out, but I think we have a five more minutes. Somebody did want to ask about the music in the film, not just the music that you're showing, which is iconic and amazing. Like, I mean, like yeah. the Adam Simpson thing is like blow, blows my mind, but people also were wondering about the music you use for the cues and how was that super expensive? Because I know about music cues, they can be really tricky. There's obviously there's a ton of like music and stuff that you're featuring. I mean, Patti LaBelle singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. This, how, how did you navigate all that stuff? <laughs> <laughs> you saw me rear back. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> the thing about the, the music, and I know Robert would feel this way. I can't speak for him, but I know he told me so that, you know, what we wanted to do in the film was to make the music a character because mm -hmm. the story of soul is 
the story of the people and the, and the music of our lives, the music of our soundtrack and the struggle, the, the, the sexiness, the beauty, the difficulty, it's all there. And, and that's so much of what Soul was as a show. And so we wanted to make sure that the music, like the, the, the sound bed, the soundtrack of our lives was in this film and was evolving just as the show was evolving. And, and it was whatever was happening in the zeitgeist was represented in the music as well. And so we knew like we had to have quintessential soul music in there and everything that would really represent the time and what we were feeling and the connections that we have to that music. And so it was a challenge because we had something like, I think 156 cues or something. It was a lot of music. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I, you know, I know my music supervisor is out there shaking his head right now because, you know, I handed him the list and he was like, hmm. <laughs> lofty goal, you know? And I said, yeah. I, we can't compromise. You know, we got to hear this. We got to hear that. We need to hear King Floyd. You know, we need to hear Express Yourself. Like everything has a purpose and it really illustrates the moment. And we knew that whatever we weren't going to use musically because we had to create, um, like for the filmmakers out there, we, we did have a Favor Nations contract between oh. all of the publishers. And that was the only yeah. way we could, you know, afford it. Um, Favor Nations, I mean, that's really, the Yeah, thing. shout out to Favor Nations. Oh, well, I, I say in addition, you know. That. It was like, how do we choose? And what we, what we, whatever we're not using, we're gonna illustrate through the score. And so that's where Robert's genius came in because right. he, could, he would come in and go, oh yeah, well, we need a little Coltrane vibe in there. Okay, let's do these changes. And then they'd hit it and right. literally record it in one take. And it was just amazing. So we recorded the whole film in two days with wow. all of those cues. So they, he was working with geniuses, you know. Well, who, uh, well, I, I think, yeah. uh, well, I think that's wonderful. I think one of my favorite music cues, um, possibly where I'm from. I mean, we hear Donny Hathaway in the in the womb when you're, and um, and it's funny because actually there's like a, a Donny Hathaway tattoo I finally found that I want to get. But beautifully, yeah, I know it's like a, it's like it's a, finally I figured it out. But uh, his voice is like it means so much to me and to, to so many, particularly a lot of obviously Chicago ones, but just to us as a as a culture and, and really it means a lot and. It's such a heartbreaking story about Ellis losing his sister and his mm. nephew. Um, and for that, that for Donnie's voice to come in the way it does, it's a beautiful piece of editing. It's a beautiful piece of way to use that yeah. song. And it's a great way to use his voice because I think his voice in a way, it, it, it is it is the most soulful, melancholy, it, his voice represents yeah. more, you know? And uh, and at the end to me that that use was so beautiful and so beautifully done. It's one. It, I was already in the whole time, but to have that moment punch me in the gut, it was really. Oh, you know, and that's exactly what I what I felt was there is if there is one song that illustrates anguish and pain and love and deep deep soulful connection, it's a song for you. And I remembered that um, it was played at Ellis's memorial as well and it was choreographed by Alvin Ailey with a beautiful tribute to him and it was um it was the most extraordinary thing and it just hit me to the core but I've always loved that song and so I knew what is the universal like language of loss and love for us culturally it's a song for you there's nothing else and Absolutely. boom it's done you know yeah. and by the same token we had to start the film with Donnie too because we were like, that's going to be the bed when, when you hear him sing the ghetto and the struggle of, of, of Black people in the beginning, knowing that that was the beginning and that we would end with his legacy, his daughter, Layla Hathaway. And so yeah. we start with Donnie and we end with Layla and she's like the legacy of soul. And so mm -hmm. when Rob G wrote that song called um, Show Me Your Soul, we knew that that was going to be the end song and that she had to take us home. That's amazing. Well, we only have one more minute, but I want to ask you both hey, as well. No, I could be here all night. <laughs> I know. Melissa, I'll give you the last word since you're our filmmaker, but I'll start oh, with yeah. this, honey. What would you want, or what would you think Ellis would have wanted his legacy to be? Oh, wow. To do it I, right. Mm -hmm. To do it right. And, and he really did work on doing it right. There was no halfway to soul. He right. did it right. And I think that he would want that. That's just me. I think that he would want that as his legacy. 
Let's do it right. Right. I agree. I agree. Thank you, Mr. Obani. You're a legend and you're an icon. We're grateful for you. Thank you so much. We love you. Thank you. <laughs> Melissa? I would say uh, that Black seeds keep on growing. And I think he, there was a reason that, just sidebar, he says that in the last episode of Soul in March of 73. And he's actually reading from a um, telegram that came in from Patti LaBelle mm. to encourage him. And she wrote, you know, although it's over, it's not the end, black seeds keep on growing. Ooh. And we also know that that is the lyrics from a song by the main ingredient, of course. <laughs> um, but I thought that that was so important because he's, he has laid these seeds and he knew yeah. that even though the show was canceled, you can't cancel soul, you can't cancel black folks, you, mm. you know, he curated the culture and he gave it to us, but just to show us what's coming next. And yeah. this idea that of perseverance and, and, um, and owning that perseverance, because we are survivors, you know, Baldwin says the same thing. We have survived until now. That's right. right? We have been through something. Yeah. And I think that that is the legacy of Ellis is that he knew that he was at the beginning of things, but that all he had to do was lay these lay this seed bed, if you will, and uh, that that would encourage us to know our, our beauty and our brilliance. Um, but I think he was in love with black culture. And so if there's like this love affair with black culture and he never wanted us to forget. And so when we made this film, that was the whole idea was to remind people of their beauty and their excellence. Absolutely. No, I, I think that's, that's beautifully said. And I think you both are a big part of his legacy. Uh, and, uh, and I think this movie will make sure that no one ever forgets what his legacy is and that we are the legacy. And I love the, that those friends of the Black Seas keep on growing. <clears throat> they always will. Uh, they you are the legacy, Lena. You know what you're doing and you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sitting at the feet, you know, taking notes and being mindful. Um, and I want to just encourage everyone in, in here tonight, please tell all the people you know to go find it. What's the quickest way, Melissa, for them to, they can go to the site? And yeah, MrSoulMovie.com. Okay, go, go yeah. to the site. Please check it out. We're going to keep talking about it. It's already getting a, a bunch of awards, a lot of people talking about the film because, it, because, because you know what, as Mr. Giovanni said, you did it right. You Aww. did it. Right. You did it the right way, and um, I know Ellis would be proud, and 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 I'm honored to be aware of who he is and what he did and his great contribution. So thank you so much for allowing me to moderate this amazing conversation. Thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you, Film Independent. Thank you, Josh. You're the best. Appreciate you, Rachel. And um, this has been an honor for me, truly. Melissa, you know this has been great, and Ms. Giovanni, it's I mean it's such a pleasure. Truly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Film Independent, Ms. Giovanni. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, everyone. And as Ellis would say, it's been beautiful. Yes, <laughs> it's been beautiful. So thank, thank you all. Thanks, everybody. And thank wish you all the best with this. I mean, I, I want to see it go all the way. Come on, Academy. Come on, Academy. Let's <laughs> oh! Speak it. Let's speak it. Okay. Do the right thing. Do the right thing, Academy, and, and give them this uh, nomination for, for Best Documentary. <laughs> that, that's what it deserves. Yep. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And if you haven't seen it, please watch the movie again. It's everybody you know to go check it out.